the Special Producers Association podcast. I'm your host, Charles Riggins, uh, treasurer of the South Coast Specialty Producers Association. In this podcast, we'll discuss production issues affecting South Coast Specialty Crops producers, especially crops as defined by the USDA are fruits, vegetables, tree nuts, dried fruits, horticulture, and nursery crops, including floriculture. The South Coast Specialty Producers Association is made up of growers, producers, chefs, customers, resource providers and other interested in producing, marketing, and supporting the South Dakota Specialty Crops, Meats, and Products. We are bringing you this podcast to help get good information to those, to you as producers, and about the topics that are important to our members. Our first series of podcasts will address the changes of pest management, especially producers in our region. There will be four episodes in the series. Each episode will feed feature different specialty crop types of crops and effective ways to implement various forms of IPM. Today we will be focusing on berries and particularly strawberry crops. Integrated pest management is a sustainable science-based decision-making process that combines biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools to identify, manage, and reduce the risk of pest and pest management tools and strategies in ways that minimize overall economic health and environmental risk. We are so excited to have our first guest, Dr. Raymond Cloyd is an extension specialist in Kansas City, or Kansas, sorry, Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. His research and extension program involves pest management, plant protection in greenhouse nurseries, landscape, turf grass, conservatories, interior scapes, Christmas trees, and vegetable and fruit production. Dr. Cloyd is the extension specialist in horticulture, entomology of the state of Kansas, with a clientele that includes homeowners, master gardeners, and professionals, and commercial operators. Welcome, Dr. Cloyd. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. I'm glad to be here today. Good to have you. Thank you. All right. In this area, we have uh, insect disease problems such as spotted wing, uh, Japanese beetle, and funguses. Uh, when should we look for these in our crops? Well, if you're talking about strawberry crops, I mean, basically uh, all of these are plant feeding uh, insects and mites. So as soon as the crop is in the ground, or even if you have it starting in the greenhouse or hoop house, uh, you need to be out there uh, when they're uh, out and growing. Uh, many of these, uh, or many of these uh, insects are some of them are very small. I mean, like thrips, uh, for one, and some of the others we deal with, like broad mite and cyclomite, are microscopic. So it's basically as soon as the crop is in the ground and growing, uh, you should do some regular what I call scouting uh, to minimize uh, the pre well to detect the presence number one, and then that consequently will allow you to implement some type of plant protection strategies to minimize any damage to the crop, especially uh, especially uh, early on where you may you don't want to compromise yield production. What are some of the main symptoms to look for when you're looking for these critters? Well, it really depends on the uh, pest, and I'll go over each one. So one of the pests we deal with on strawberry crops is spider mites, two-spotted spider mite in particular. And uh, again, most of these insects or mites are on the leaf underside because they don't like direct sunlight. So uh, for, for two-spotted spider mite, what you're going to see on the leaves is sort of a, we call it speckling, uh, a whiting of the leaves because they feed by removing the chlorophyll content and consequently that results in specific symptoms such as speckling. If you look on the leaf underside you'll see webbing. Um, one of the ways we like to do it two-spotted spider mite is either uh, randomly suck some leaves and shake them over a white piece of paper and you'll see the uh, adults and the larvae nymphs crawling around. Uh, on leaf hoppers uh, you'll see sort of a a whiting of the strawberry leaves. Again, they're going to be on the leaf underside, uh, very mobile, wedge-shaped insects. Uh, thrips are also on the leaf underside. You'll see, again, discoloration of the foliage. And then, um, like broad mite or cyclamen mite, uh, you'll see the distorted, the, the new growth will be very twisted and distorted. Uh, and again, you can't see them with the naked eye. You gotta take the plant back or uh, parts of the plant back, look under a dissecting scope or send it to 
an entomologist for verification. Now, the one that attacks the fruit is the, the, the ligus or the, the tarnished plant bug, and uh, they're sucking insects, and they'll, uh, they'll feed on the, the strawberries, and they basically cause um, uh, sort of distortion. Of course, stink bugs can also feed on strawberry fruit, and they'll cause what we call the cat facing, which we, one of our common terms. Uh, and again, uh, that can reduce the marketability of the crop uh, as such. So, you know, we have these we have these insects and mice that feed on the leaves, and uh, we have those that feed on the the, straw, the actual fruit of the strawberry itself. Okay. Well, what can we do to avoid these? I mean, is there anything? Well, uh, avoid. <laughs> uh, there's prevention, and the, uh, one of the one of the best, if you can. Let me start from scratch. Is if if there are any uh, resistant or tolerant cultivars available, uh, that would be number one. Uh, the, the, the primary way is to scout aggressively early on to detect them early so you can uh, implement whatever strategies, whether using miticides. Uh, proper fertility is always, is always good. Uh, don't over fertilize. Many insects and mites tend to feed on plants that are getting too much fertilizer. Uh, weed management, many weeds out there, both broadly, broadly in particular, uh, will harbor or serve as an alternate food source for spider mites and thrips and aphids, which can also be a problem on strawberries and leaf hoppers. Uh, the other uh, reason why you want to remove weeds from the growing area is that a number of weeds will harbor the viruses, um, which are a disease that can be vectored by thrips and leaf hoppers uh, uh, to, to strawberries per se. So, you know, there's, there, there's those aspects that you, you need to implement if, even if you're gonna use a miticide you need to implement these strategies uh, also. I mean, there, there's no one, one cure or there's no one, no mechanism strategy that's going to uh, reduce these pests overall. And also understanding when they're gonna be present. I mean, two-spotted spider mite likes it hot and dry, so you can expect it to be in the summertime. Aphids like it uh, early cool, uh, and some of the others, of course, are gonna be present when the, um, strawberry, the strawberry plants are in fruit. That would include ligus bug, and um, also, uh, well, thrips will be there, but lagus bug will be one of the big ones, uh, and also some some of these stink bugs. All right. Um, so, does it prevent or is it platinum and plastic or uh, with straw bedding is that uh, good or bad as far as uh, bug control? Well, it, it's a uh, 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 straw or any type of mulch, even a cover crop is always going to be beneficial to the plant because it, uh, it prevents heaving, it maintains even moisture. But uh, some studies have shown that some of the straw mulches and cover crops will attract uh, beneficial insects. And uh, above ground insects and below ground, like uh, carabid beetles, ground beetles, and they, they may or may not feed on the pests, but it's always good to have an ecosystem balance, which includes some of the, the good insects that provide, could provide some regulatory process against things like spider mites and thrips. Um, some of these insect pests may not have a, a viable beneficial insect, but it's always good to have those. Uh, it's, it's always good to have a balanced ecosystem um, because you, you want to take advantage of some of those, those good insects that, may, that are out there. So the next question I have is, uh, what about spacing? Does that uh, affect bugs from one plant to the other? So um, say like if you got your strawberries too close to your cucumbers. Um, yes. Well, one of uh, the, the two-spotted spider mites, because they don't fly, um, if your plants are spaced, you know, too close together, then it'll be easy for them, especially when the leaves are touching, to move from one plant to the next. Uh, the problem with spacing too closely, it also makes it difficult if you're using miticides to get the good coverage of leaf underside. And that's the key is you want, you have to get a leaf underside where most of these insects and mite pests are gonna be problematic. Uh, so adequate spacing uh, for plant growth, of course, is number one, but uh, you don't want them too close. I know there's that, uh, <clears throat> always that in the back of your mind, if I plant more, I get more yield, but that may, that may compromise your yield because you're dealing with uh, the mites are spreading, the infestations are being uh, distributed spatially, uh, widely in, in the crop, 
and that can be problematic, problem overall. So yeah. Okay. Um, I'm gonna kind of change to raspberries for a minute. <laughs> I know um, I'm fairly new to the raspberry business, but I know there's a difference between fall bearing and uh, summer bearing, and the bugs that go um, with them. Is there any way to prevent bugs in raspberries? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's preve prevention is a very loose term, Charles. And uh, for raspberries, you know, we deal with spotted wing drosophila, Japanese beetle, uh, some other pests. Um, I don't really think there's anything preventively. You can use like traps, pheromone traps, um, trapping for the spotted wing drosophila. Uh, that, that's, that's more of a detection, uh, not prevention, that, that helps you know when to time your insecticide sprays or when you need to harvest, things like that. Uh, the raspberry cane borer, really nothing preventatively other than, of course, uh, sealing off any wounds and things like that. But so, so from a prevention standpoint, Charles, it's, that's a very difficult term and we've kind of gotten away from that. It's more um, getting out detection early on by scouting and that includes the, the beat method where you shake branches over a white piece of paper with attached to a clipboard. There's the pheromone traps. Uh, there's the trapping for the spotted wing drosophila, which has its own trap. Japanese beetle traps, which we don't recommend because they lure more Japanese beetles. So we use those to place outside the raspberries to lure them away. So, uh, and then leaf hoppers will also can be a problem on raspberries. And again, uh, it's just getting out there and looking at leaves uh, early on in the season. And when you detect them, then you can take the appropriate action. Okay. All right. Now, um, on insecticides, um, I know there's a lot of organic producers in this day and age, and uh, I'm one that just does try to avoid all pesticides. I don't use any. I try to use chickens for my leaf hoppers, you know, so they circle the garden areas, um, keep my plants, of course. But um, is there any good products that would help me on the organic side to, as far as insecticides go? Uh, well, organic is a very difficult term for me to understand. Uh, it's more of a marketing advertising term. However, if you're with the USDA and the NLP program, which is the National Organics Program, and you're certified, then, then it's very easy because uh, there's our, there are do's and don'ts. So if you're certified on, under the NLP program, there's a very short list of insecticides, miticides you have available. They include like pyrethrins, acidiractin, oil, soaps, um, beet, uh, bacteria products. Um, so some of these are, are, are marginally effective, but the other downside is they don't last long in the environment, which means you gotta apply them more often. And they, they themselves are very broad spectrum and can kill beneficial insects and other things like that. So I am not a proponent for spraying. I know, I know why you do it. And if the consumer would accept uh, some blemish fruit, we would get away from a lot of it. But, for people that, uh, for, for producers that want to, uh, want to use the least toxic materials, again, whatever that means, um, you know, pyrethrins, which are based on chrysanthemum flowers, which is one of our oldest materials, is out there. However, it is toxic to bees. It is toxic to natural enemies, but it doesn't last very long. Uh, what, I, what I try to recommend is horticultural oils based on mineral oil or petroleum-based oil um, these are suffocants, and um, they have minimal impact on natural enemies. They will kill anything you touch, but uh, they don't last very long, and they're extremely safe to humans in most cases and invertebrates. So, and then the other one are the insecticidal soaps uh, based on potassium, salts, and fatty acids. Uh, they're also contacts. They are desiccants, um, but they have minimal residual, and again, they're, they're less toxic to, to workers uh, or people overall. So, it's, you know, trying to find some of the materials that are out there um, have marginal efficacy. That is, they, they, they probably will not have a significant impact on suppressing pest populations. Um, and so you really have to, you have to, you have to apply them more often. Okay. Um, now, is there any good insects that, or any ways to bring, help bring good insects in? Um, like you said, mulch helps bring good insects in. Is there any other? Yeah, there's a lot of good, uh, you know, insects and mites. 
and you know, uh, big eyed bugs, ladybird beetles, green lace wings, um, minute pirate bugs, or, or the aureus species, uh, uh, surfing flies, um, things like that. So they're out there, and, and the ways you, you lure them are putting in plants, flowering plants, or floral resources uh, that will attract them. Now, um, the, the, the caveat is, or the question is, if I attract them, will they provide regulation or suppress the pest? And that's not always true. Uh, I, wrote, I, I wrote a paper last year uh, in the journal Insects, which is a online version, and I'd be happy to send it to you about where there's lots of information about luring insects into areas, including organic production systems, but they don't suppress the pest populations and reduce plant damage. And so there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's sort of a missing link um, there, but overall, what you want to put in are flowering plants like echinacea, fennel, dill, things like that. Those will all bring in good, benef good or beneficial insects. And it's again like like uh, cover cropping and straw. It's always good to have a, a nice balanced ecosystem. Yeah. But again, it doesn't guarantee that your uh, good insects are going to start reducing the populations of your bad insects. Okay. Now, as far as insects and high tunnels, um, I know a lot of people are going to high tunnels now, mm -hmm. greenhouses. Um, what's the best way to keep bugs out of your greenhouses or keep bugs to get in the greenhouses? Okay, so, so there, you, you, in, in greenhouse production systems where there's actually a frame structure, uh, screening, insect screening is very effective if you can do it. Not everybody can do it because of the age of the greenhouse, but um, that is a vile. I work with a number of growers, producers that put screens on uh, the outside. Now, you, you can't just simply put a screen on your vent. You need to build a box because you need to uh, take into account the airflow restriction. If you, if you just put a screen on your fan, you're going to burn your motors out. So there's an organization, I believe, called the National Greenhouse Manufacturers Association. They have a really good website which guides you through uh, how to develop a structure, a screening structure that will allow you to uh, put the screen in and not burn your fans out. But a screen, it prevents many insects, uh, even some of the smaller ones like thrips and aphids and white flies from getting in. And by doing that, uh, you restrict them from coming inside the greenhouse, especially in the summertime or when the field crops are being harvested and the, green, and the insects and mites need a food source. High tunnels, it's a little different because if you roll them up or you open them, uh, you really can't put screening. However, what you can do and what I recommend is getting what we call hopper stopper tape or yellow, uh, yellow tape. It's like a, like a blanket, it's about it's one foot in width. And you put it on the outside of the area where you rolled up and it'll capture insects that are coming in. Now it's not foolproof, but it will capture them and you, you can reduce the influx of, in, of insects coming from the outside into your uh, high tunnel by doing that. Okay, some useful information there. Um, now you, you also do it with uh, house plants too. Um, yeah, I know you want to avoid your bugs in the house, uh, but um, the question, I guess, is so, some plants need beneficial bugs. Um, is there good bugs to have in the house? Well, that's a good question, Terrell. The problem with a ho house plants is like one plant in the corner, and the the a beneficial insects will not have a viable food source. Uh, I, I I recommend the use of beneficial insects and mites in greenhouse production systems, large areas, and uh, even a little smaller ones, in uh, con uh, conservatories and interior scapes, obviously because those are very sensitive areas and they can't spray. But for, for just house plants overall, I, I recommend just keeping your plants healthy by water, fertilizing, uh, light, give, give, them, give them good light. You know, if they need shade, give them shade like a, um, oh gosh, an Espedistra, you know, the, those plants need shade. Uh, and, and the best thing is, you know, if there's a problem, just take it outside, use a high wa pressure water spray and, and dislodge the insects. And then have to let it dry and bring it back in. I, I really do not make recommendations for beneficial insects in, in, in 
a homeowner for just one or two house blankets, yeah. Okay. Now, I say the people that take them out and then bring them back in in the wintertime, um, should they be checking under all the leaves? What things do they look for before they bring them back in? Yes, absolutely. If you've let your house plants or any plant um, spend the time outside and then you're going to bring it in, uh, you need to check it over. Uh, and again, if you can use a high pressure water spray, just uh, blast it and you'll knock all the insects and mites off prior to bringing it in. Because if you bring it in, um, a lot of the environments are conducive for eight insect and mite development. And, the, and again, you don't want to spray in your home, uh, but you should check them before you bring them in. Yes. Okay. Um, now, to kind of back to the fruit and the high tunnel thing. Uh, what's your recommendation on grow, trying to grow fruit in high tunnels? So say like uh, here in South Dakota, uh, wolf berries or gojo berries are not in our growing region, but it could be a good market. Is there a good ones you can put in a high tunnel or is, or is that a bad idea you want to avoid away from? Well, again, I'm, I'm an entomologist, Charles. I, I was a horticulturist in California previously, but... Oh. Uh, that would be a question for more of a horticulturist, but I can tell you this is knowing your zone, uh, your hardiness zone, and of course the, uh, the, uh, the high tunnels will give you some advantage, is, is find the varieties or cultivars that are going to tolerate your conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to the proper plant for that location. Like I would, well, I guess the reason I asked is because when I was, or got into this, I was told do not put strawberries in high tunnels because once the bugs in there, you're never getting rid of them. Um, that's what I was kind of guessing. Is there any plants you should avoid for bugs getting in and hard to control after they're there, if they get in there? So. Well, every plant, um, depending on what plant it is, has its share of insect or mite pests. When you're talking about fruits and berries, whether it be, uh, whether it be blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, boysenberry, uh, any, any, any of the brambles and even the fruit trees, they're, they're going to have their series of insects and mite pests. I mean, apples would be coddling moth, apple maggot. Um, you know, we told we talked about strawberry has a problem about possibly about three or four. Uh, blueberries have their share of pests and things like that. So really, by, by, by knowing the plant uh, you're putting in, uh, you're, you'll be able to determine what the potential pests are and, and what's in what time of year they're going to pass. Again, outdoors, it's, it's more, there's more seasonality. Uh, like I mentioned, two-spotted spider mite will be more problematic in the summertime because it lacks hot and dry, whereas aphids and leafhoppers may be more prevalent in the spring uh, or late summer, early fall more so. So it's always good to pay attention to the seasonality of the pest, and you want to take good records, you know, be out there looking, and when you, when you find a pest, make notes of it. So then you can be prepared for next year when you, want, when you can anticipate the pest. And, of course, that's going to vary uh, from... Uh, if you have a cooler or warm spring or a warm or cool summer, because insects and mites are cold-blooded and they're going to respond to temperature. If it's hot, high, they'll respond favorably. If it's cool, it'll slow down their development. Right. Um, is there other plants that you have around your yard that may home uh, insects that are non-beneficial that you may want to look at trying to eliminate that around your place, so, uh, like dogwoods? I know as a host for bugs for raspberry plants, is there anything like that you would say maybe try to thin down within an area of your product? Yeah, I mean, if you, you've got a dogwood also that's oyster shell scale and some other things, but if you have plants in your, around your area that, uh, uh, like, like, let me just use marigolds, for example, tajetis, marigolds. Um, a lot of people use marigolds as trap crops. Some of them use as companion planting but marigolds are great for spider mites and thrips. <laughs> so, you know, that would be a plant that I definitely would not put near my strawberries because those are two pests that could be problematic on the strawberries. So uh, it, that's, that's one of, you know, again, I'd have to rack my brain for, but again, weeds, <clears throat> many of the weeds that are out there, uh, broadleaf weeds will be, could be serve as a alternate food source or uh, for, for many insects and mite pests, yeah. So weed, weed management's really critical. Okay. Um, so, say if you got a fruit and a vegetable production. I know uh, a lot of insects, some cross back and forth, some do not. Um, is there should be a certain gap between your consistent 
crop that comes back every year, so your raspberries and strawberries, and your ones you plant every year, like your tomatoes and pumpkins and whatever. Should be a certain distance between those crops for bugs, or as long as you keep them a distance. Yeah, uh, a fair distance. That's an interesting question. It really depends because the insects that are mobile or can fly won't make you much of a difference. But, you know, really what I would look at is, okay, if I want to grow raspberries and also grow cucumbers, what are some of the common pests? And one of them would be to me right off the bat, two-spotted two spider mite. But remember, two-spotted spider mite doesn't fly, although it can be kind of wind current. So as long as you keep a pretty good distance between the plants, what's a pretty good distance? Uh, 10 to 20 feet, you know, between between the crops. If you're trying to avoid cross cross contamination between the specific in, specific insect or mite pest, thrips would be another one, uh, and they can fly as adults and, and easily get kind of wind currents too. Okay, so say if you're trying to keep good space between those, and say you want to put asparagus in between your strawberries and your regular garden to give that barrier, is there any bugs? You know, say if you have 20 feet of asparagus in there, is there any bugs that affect asparagus that, or that'd be a good transition between the two? Well, it, you know, the, on, the only pest we know, and I think I did an extension publication, is the common common asparagus beetle. And of course it comes out when the spears are coming out of the ground because that's where the females lay their eggs. But really, um, uh, asparagus is a great crop because when we have one grower that keeps five acres it doesn't get very many pests. You know, if you're an entomologist, it's a little depressing, but the main one we deal with is the common asparagus beetle, and it will not feed, as we know, on any other crop but asparagus. So, yeah, that would be a good crop to put in because, one, uh, it doesn't get too many insect pests. It does get some diseases, but not as much as other crops. That would be a good crop to put in between, um, say, if you're growing, like, uh, a bramble and, and a vegetable crop. Yeah. Okay. and. So if you're going to, if you get a bug infestation in your strawberries, and I know there's some farmers that every four years they're putting new strawberries in and digging up their old ones. Um, smaller guys may just wait till they show up and deal with them. Um, how far would you move your garden plots away from each, from an old planting to avoid bugs as far as like strawberries go? That's a good question, and I really don't think it matters. I mean, insects, okay. insects and mites are going to find them. Yeah, I really don't think it matters. I, uh, I really don't think it matters, Charles. Yeah, they're going to find it one way or the other. Okay. Well, it was really good talking with you. Um, you too. Thanks for um, your question. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of information to take in all of a sudden. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I would like to thank you for joining us today, and uh, we'll be chat with you again sometime. I look forward to it. Yes, I hope I can uh, uh, deal with another crop or whatever you guys want me to speak on or talk about. I'd be more than willing to uh, share my knowledge with you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in to the Southwest Mission Producers Association podcast. We will be bringing you more episodes on inter 